Hello, and welcome to this, the Lord's 74th episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, a D&D and Magic the Gathering podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we're the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And you might notice there's a bit of a delay there. That's because we're not in the same room anymore. Nope. A little crazy. You can see it by our crazy. backgrounds as well if you're watching the video yeah. edition of the podcast. Yes, which you can get on YouTube every other week free for everyone every other monday it's fantastic um sam is actually at a desk that's like properly set up uh i am in a giant empty living room of a house that i bought <laughs> so we're and waiting that's how it shall <laughs> remain empty it, it will uh, literally as of recording this tomorrow it will not be empty anymore <laughs> uh but currently i have a router and i have a ps5 that i tried to hook up because i want to remote play into it at work didn't work because I don't have a TV or anything to plug it into and actually change the settings on it. I was kind of hoping it would just like, but no, alas, it, it wants you to it wants you to be hooked in. Literally, it's sh- this whole this whole thing. I am ready to be done with this week. I'm ready for September to come and our lease to be done and everything to be out of our apartment, so that yeah. I'm just here and just all of my stuff is here. That's the biggest thing. It's very stressful. <laughs> No, I I did all of my moving last week, and uh, yeah, I'm still exhausted from all that. I'm in the thick of it, and I want to kill myself, but it's fine. We've got a podcast. We've got a BNR announcement for for Magic the Gathering, which we're very excited about. Uh, We got Controversy. With D and D, shocker, right? It, it was <laughs> quiet for a while, but it's we're back. We're back. No worries. It was too quiet. It was that's the, it's exactly it. It was way too quiet. And I I have an L eight, so you know everything with the podcast <laughs> is as it Things should are be. As should be. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would ask what we're playing right now, but I'm not playing shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still I, on. I'm, I'm st- I'm still on the uh, the the old school RuneScape trend because I have it on my phone, and that's kind of all I can do right now. I've been going back through uh, Bioshock Infinite and trying to get all the achievements there. Which, um, if you're not familiar with games that came out in the early 20 aughts, uh, they're buggy. Yeah, that's a task. It's it's a little Herculean. Yeah, I. I'm all for, like, completing a game, getting a platinum trophy, and I have some, like, crazy difficult platinum trophies. Yeah. Um, but they're for games that I really, really, really love, and I know I'm going to spend, like, 120 hours playing anyway, so I might as well, you know? Like, Persona. Like, a, like the Persona yeah. games are, like, my hardest platinum. <laughs> I like a nice achievement grind, but I will say, like, a lot of... T- it's usually DLC achievements I give up on because you can get the platinum without ever doing DLC achievements, and then sometimes the DLC achievements are just way too much. So the the thing with that, it drives me crazy that you have a game. This happened with with me for Kingdom Hearts three, which I got the platinum mm-hmm. for, and then a year later they released uh, the Remind DLC, which added like a bunch of new super bosses and like a new post game thing that you can go play through, and it was all very well done. Yeah. Uh, some of the trophies are tied to things called pro codes and easy codes. Easy codes make the game a lot easier, and you can fuck around, and it's very fun. Pro sure. codes make the game a lot harder. <laughs> like, all right, turn on the pro code for you're always at 1 HP, or your magic doesn't regenerate, or you constantly drain HP, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And one of the trophies is complete the game with all pro codes turned on. Mm. I am not that much of a sadist. <laughs> there are some people that are. So every time I'm like scrolling through my trophy list on PlayStation now, it's like, yes, I have the platinum for this. I got the trophies. I did the base but you're game. you're still at like 97% on the... It's that percentage is never going to be 100 now, and it drives me yeah. fucking nuts. It drives me nuts. I, I don't know why they See, do that. What gets me is when it's completely RNG based achievements uh so i do a lot of roguelikes and a lot of the times those are like okay there's you know 17 different levels that can spawn on any run and on those levels there's a one in 20 chance that the thing you need and you need 20 of those things so it's like you have to spend 117 (laughs) hours in the game literally it's like every rpg ever where it's just like grinding for loot constantly Mm. and 
can we go back to what was happening in like the 360 and PS3 era where you were getting like standalone DLC games? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like I where, um, uh, oh God, Infamous Second Son. It was the PS4 Infamous game. It had mm-hmm. DLC, which was Dying Light. And it was its own launcher and it was its own game and it had its own trophy list separate from the base game. You didn't have to play or beat the base game. Like I know some people are talking about it with Elden Ring and the Erd Tree DLC where it's like, oh, you have to reach a certain point and have beaten a certain boss to even start the DLC in the first place. Yeah. Which... Uh, in the case of that game, obviously you want to be, you want to get good, <laughs> right? You That's pretty standard across that that that, uh, that franchise. But oh yeah, I mean, we could go way back and start doing the achievements that are like be the number one player for a week on the online multiplayer. All right. Well, Connor seems to no longer be here. Oh, okay. So we got a second clip now. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to know. We're learning as we go here, okay? We've recorded remotely with guests. I'm in an empty room. It's a whole thing. We'll see where that splices in. Anyway, I great. think it's about time we get into the, the regular meat of the podcast. Of course, this, the Duels and Manadorks podcast, you can get every other week on YouTube, uh, Apple, Google. Actually, Google, you can't anymore. Can't do Google. Google podcasts. Google. <laughs> Google podcasts are dead now, <laughs> apparently. Uh, but Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music. You can leave us a review, which was really helpful. Uh, we used to record it live on TikTok, but we're in different places now, so that doesn't really work quite yeah. as well. Uh, we also have Instagram, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. If you want the podcast early and ad free, you can check out Patreon.com/slash The Dungeon Bros. Five dollars a month gets you early ad free access. You can join for free, even. If you want to just like submit questions for the show and uh, we have the $15 and up tier. If you want your name read at the end of the show, of course, which we forgot to do for the last episode, which we're is fine. Horrible. It's just, it's Brandon Vol. We, we like Brandon. <laughs> we'll mention him again <laughs> at the end of the podcast. Of course. Of course. Monday night magic on hiatus at the time. At Season the two time. will begin eventually. It will begin eventually. Uh, we want to do some spell table shenanigans. Maybe get some guests like Brandon Vole. Perhaps if you were to join the Patreon at fifteen dollars a month, there might be a new little benefit there where you, you can join us for Monday Night Magic. It's a game of Commander. Our friend Wyatt, other Magic people, we'll figure it out. We'll figure um, it out. But we will go over, as we do every single episode, the upcoming releases for D and D and Magic: The Gathering. Sam, what we yeah. got? So starting with D and D, of course. Uh, one D and D, or the 2024 revision of tw- of Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, the player ha- the player's handbook will be coming out on September 17th, unless you're a special special boy, in which case you already have it. We have it. <laughs> we. Have it. Uh, moving on from that, of course, the dungeon master. Oh, well, we're gonna hold it up. Yeah, it's in my back. It's in my work backpack because I I've been looking through it when I'm at work and I have downtime and I'm not just completely exhausted, so. It's very fun. It's very cool. There you go. Uh, then we have the Dungeon Master's Guide. That'll be coming out on November 12th of this year. And finally, the Monster Manual will be coming out on February 18th of 2025. And there are D&D Beyond releases, uh, I believe, two weeks prior to those. Yeah, so, with zero controversy whatsoever. No, we to- definitely won't talk about that again in uh, no. five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to... Uh, Magic the Gathering. Bloomborough is out now, completely. Mm-hmm. You can buy mm-hmm. it anywhere your magic is sold. Uh, anyway. Ooh. Hold on, hold on. MagicCon, I need to look this up because the last time, it's the next thing. It's the next thing. Yeah. Uh, the last time I looked, it was Magic the, the Festival in a Box was still available like three days after the secret lair dropped for it. Really? Which, oh, okay, it's, it's a pre-order now. Wait, it's a pre-order? How is that possible? Hold on. Okay, well, this is real time. This is live. <laughs> we're, we're learning as we go. Oh, no, the sale ends. This sale ends in 63 days. Limited stock pre-order at what? This doesn't make any sense. Anyway, the last time I saw it, it was still available, but your mileage may vary. <laughs> and what we're talking about, of course, is the Mystery Booster 2 Festival in a Box, which mm-hmm. became available last week on August 19th. Uh, Apparently. 
Apparently, yeah. So some collector boosters along with a mystery booster two box, mm-hmm. which uh, honestly it has a couple secret layers in it as well. Monetarily, if you manage to get your hands on it, fantastic deal. Seems seems like a good deal. Let if alone you get not, your hands on it. <laughs> not to mention just the reprint, the value that will come from mystery booster two. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anyway, upcoming next is Duskborn House of Horror. Uh, that will that debut will begin this coming weekend at PAX West. Spoiler season will begin on August 31st. Uh, that will run for about three weeks, with pre-release being on September 20th and full release being on September 27th. Yeah, so when this podcast goes live for the free feeds, it will be after the reveal, but we recorded it before the reveal. Sorry. Ooh, but the next, the next podcast is going to have plenty of Duskborn to talk about for sure. Oh, yeah. Following that, we have the actually the actual Mystery Booster 2 release, and that'll be at MagicCon Vegas on October 25th through the 27th. Get them while you can. They'll probably be gone quick. And I now realize that this little secret layer pre-order thing is probably um, is probably to pre-order a festival in the box at MagicCon Vegas and just pick it up. That makes sense. That, that makes sense. For, that makes sense to me. Anyway, <laughs> further than that, we've got Foundations. That will be released on November 15th. This is going to be the standard kind of foundations. uh, Five-year minimum run in standard. Yeah, so they changed the standard rotation to three years relatively recently. So they already lengthened it there. And then this set specifically is a five-year rotation for standard just to kind of create a foundation for it. Um, There's also rumblings of a leak for the next set as well. Yeah. I know a little bit. Do you know? You probably know more than I do about this. I didn't I've include it seen, in any of the stuff. I've only seen a little bit, but of course, uh, Wizards has told us their. They told us, I guess, almost two years ago, their fi- their three and five year plans, and they gave us some hints mm-hmm. uh, towards names of uh, uh, upcoming sets or project names. And uh, one that has been talked about, I've seen recently, is the uh, multiplanar. Uh, race the multiplanar stock car race basically <laughs> yeah they're they're going cars we're getting wipeout <laughs> should we could... you know it's it's something i don't it, we'll, t- we'll probably talk about it a little more uh as we talk about the magic the gathering state of design a little bit further on in the podcast uh but man that's that's an interesting theme they've decided to go with i mean did you think they were going to go with Clue and Murder Mystery? Did no. we think they'd no. be going for Cowboys? Like, well, did we I, think I, they'd be going for, like, like 90s horror? You know? <laughs> they're yeah, kind of they're going hog wild with it right now. I don't know. I think that the, uh, the with Thunder Junction, at least that had potential there. And same with uh, Duskworn, at least they, there definitely is, is an area to grow there. I mean, you know, obviously they've done the fairy tales in, in Eldraine, Wilds of Eldraine specifically. Mm-hmm. So, I th- you know, I, th- I think that these sort of like bigger concepts of, oh, this is where all the, this is our, the fanfic worlds uh, where all these things can clash. I think it's cool. However, yeah, the very specific, like, this is a murder mystery or this is a, this is this is pod racing. This um, is pod racing. <laughs> we will literally be getting pod racing. Yeah, <laughs> it's so, it's a choice. A yeah, yeah. It's it's a choice. Um, and I think they I think there's a leak that they're gonna be like returning to a plane they haven't done in a little while. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's all rumors at this point. They haven't officially announced anything. But let's move on and let's get into the meat of today's episode. Uh, we are, of course, going to start with D&D Beyond. D&D uh, D&D Beyond. D&D Beyond. Uh, so, <sighs> Twitter loves to run with things. And I will, do, I, yes. I will also say, they, they, well, let's just start from the base. They put out a change log uh, announcement on D&D Beyond to announce what is going to be changed with the upcoming release of the 2024 edition of the Player's Handbook. Uh, they listed out all of the changes. Effect, well, they, they told you what's going to change. All the basic rules are going to change. Subclasses are going to be updated, all of that kind of stuff. And the one thing that they put was if you were playing, in, if you're going to continue to play in a former version of uh, D&D, the default is going to be 
the 2024 revisions that we've mm -hmm. made. And if you want to play with the old versions, you will, the easiest way to do that for your character sheets and stuff is to create a homebrew version of it and then just use that. Mm -hmm. Now, that is what they said in their first changelog announcement. The article that got spread around to everyone, because no one actually reads the changelog. Why yeah. would they? That, why go to the source when you can just have someone tell you uh, <laughs> their interpretation of it, right? Uh, this is, and I'm going to call this one out specifically. It was wargamer.com. Uh, the writer was Matt Bassel. And he wrote about uh, this changelog. Specifically, the title of this article is saying, D&D Beyond is deleting all 5e spells and magic items. The digital platform D&D Beyond is keeping most of 5e, but deleting all its old spells and magic items, replacing them with 2024 content. And... He goes on to uh, explain his interpretation of the changelog, uh, operating under the assumption that they would remove the previous options entirely, which even in that changelog announcement, they specified if you had the 2014 player's handbook or any of the 2014 content, you can still access it. Yeah. Okay. And you just can't. The, the the main thing that they went through describing was if you had 2024 content, you couldn't use that in the 2014 system because it's not designed for it. But you could use any 2014 content in the 2024 system. That is what that is what their first change look said. People freaked out because of the headline. Oh, my God, they're deleting everything, even though that's not what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when people realized that that's not what they were doing, the the, the outrage morphed into, um, oh, so we're not going to be able to play 2014, the 2014 version effectively because you're going to have to do this workaround for homebrew. And people were very, very upset about this. Um, I think it was, is it annoying? Yeah. If you're going to if you're going to finish a campaign in the in the original Five E from 2014, very frustrating. Reasonably, reasonably so. Um, but <laughs> the upgrades are almost all going to be better in the 2024 20, mm -hmm. version, in my opinion. We've been looking at the the UAs as they've been coming out. We have the player's handbook. We've looked through it. Like the updates are going to be good. The problem goes with, oh, they've never done this before. They're deleting content and replacing it with new content. And if you remember, when they released Volo's Guide to Monsters, when they released Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, when they did updates to subclasses, when they did updates to spells, updates to feats, uh, updates to how they, they set up races in the original 5e, they just overwrote mm -hmm. the old version because that's the new way it's done. Yes. And I don't see, I mean, obviously people are looking, ever since the OGL, it seems, everyone's been looking and chomping at the bit to jump down Wizards of the Coast throat when it comes to D&D. And in my estimation, this is not different than anything that they've done with the move from 4E to 5E, with any video game when they release like a game-changing update. You can't just play the old version of the video game. Right. <laughs> you got to use the new version of it. So I don't, from my perspective, I don't get, I don't really get where these people are coming from ultimately. Yeah. It's, it's one thing if they were just taking away and saying you can never use it again. Um, but a lot of it's, a lot of it's not changing, changing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's been going to be updates to words literally like f phrasing <laughs> yeah uh and and just coming in line with the new it's not even new terminology just the the more uh ad specific terminology mm -hmm. um and and i mean they did they did come out later uh well, about as i'm looking about 14 hours ago yeah so the updated change log they released the they they note that people were not happy uh with with uh, their original change log and they heard the feedback and they thank people for speaking up, even though I'm sure they're exceptionally frustrated. No, oh, yeah. 
They, they said that their excitement with the 2024 rule books led them to view the planned updates as welcome improvements and free upgrades to existing content. I want to note the free upgrade part mm -hmm. because most of the updates that happen to the game system happen at the basic rules level, the system reference document, which is Creative Commons. Yep. So it would just be available for free for anyone that uses D&D Beyond in the same way that you can have a free account on D&D Beyond without buying any of the books and still make some of the characters uh, using certain classes, any of the classes with certain subclasses associated with them. And that's even going to be more expanded with the new basic rule system that they're going to have in Creative Commons. But uh, they said they quote misjudged the impact of this change and they agree that you should be free to choose your own way to play and then they take your feedback to heart and this is what they're going to do players who have access to the 2014 players handbook will maintain their character options spells and magical items in their character sheets players with access to the 2024 and the 2014 digital players handbooks can select from both sources when creating new characters players will not need to rely on homebrew or use their 2014 player options including spells and magic items as recommended in the previous change logs and they note players will continue to have access to their free shared and purchased items on D&D Beyond with the ability to use previously acquired player options when creating characters and using character sheets they are not changing players' current character sheets except for relabeling and renaming. Examples include races to species, inspiration to heroic inspiration, and cast spell to magic. Um, ultimately, a lot of people are looking at this as what happened with the OGL and how they walked mm -hmm. back a lot of stuff after, contra after people rightfully spoke out against it. Right. And people are like heralding this as another like big victory. And in my mind, it looks like that change log, like that updated one is literally just, hey, we want to clarify all of this. And yeah, we'll make a toggle switch for you. Yeah. That's all I'm... this is. <laughs> D and, uh, Wizards of the Coast has had just uh, a phenomenal issue maybe maybe it's maybe it is the the you know people looking to uh come after them maybe it is just that they uh the people publishing things are you know maybe maybe we've laid off the wrong people when it comes to publishing uh <laughs> the uh things that go out of wizards of the coast but man yeah they've had a hard time having to come back and clarify everything over the past couple of years uh, i do find it funny because as I, as we first started hearing about this, uh, I very quickly got an email from Roll Twenty. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Roll Twenty <laughs> said, "Hey, don't worry, we're just adding a new character sheet option for 2024. You'll still be able to use your 2014 edition." Yeah, it, it was a very sly marketing opportunity from them. Honestly, they really took the opportunity, and yeah, you good on them for one thing. You got to run with it. Yeah, right for one thing. <laughs> That's a whole other. That's a whole yeah. other episode of a podcast in and of itself <laughs> with Roll Twenty, but like it ever ever since the OGL, people have been primed to jump down Wizards of the Coast throats about anything that goes wrong. Yeah, um, it, it was happening with all of the Unearthed Arcana they were re releasing about how they're ruining the Rogue, they're ruining the Ranger, they're ruining whatever even though they had explicitly on multiple occasions said, no, we're just trying something crazy and getting feedback. And now mm -hmm. we have the player's handbook and some people are going to say it's because of the outrage, even though I think it's just the nature of the design process. It's basically the same. <laughs> it really <laughs> with, is. With revisions and quality of life improvements and more options. That's literally all it is. If you and love 5e, there's no reason not to move to the updated version ultimately and it's one of those things where it's the most interaction they and research it feels that they've done probably for a system or for a, a system of this size and with a oh, fan base of this magnitude like obviously for fourth edition flopped for a reason and fifth edition was a, a callback to the original and so mm -hmm. now we're we're you know it, it even then it wasn't still something you know perfect not no, saying this I've, new thing is perfect by any means. No, you can't make it. You can't make a perfect tabletop RPG because it all comes down to preference at the end mm -hmm. of the day. It's a game after all. Like there's not the perfect game that everyone loves to play except for NCAA football right now apparently. <laughs> 
Sure. <laughs> it seems like every one of their mothers. I have people at work that bought a PlayStation 5 and NCAA football just for that. That's they haven't played games in years. A choice. It's something. It's it's not me, but it's something. Uh, yeah, not okay. You won't you won't find me on that on those servers either. But uh, no, not at all. But like, if you like five E, this is just better five E. They mm-hmm. spent they spent at what now two years playtesting yeah. it with UAs at this point before the release, and not to mention the over 10 years we've now had since the release of fifth edition that they've been able to iterate on and iterate on and improve and get ideas and improve and refine. And Mm -hmm. all these, all these new rule books are, are that distilled refined version presented to us. Um, Ultimately all good things. (laughs) Sure. You know, Uh, the OGL was awful, but it ended up with the best possible outcome, which is, all of the stuff is Creative Commons and more yeah. open than it was before. And D and D Beyond, like, yeah, it's ultimately not changed. You now have a little toggle switch, and you can pick which version you want to use. So, all good things. Um, I'm kind of over this like insistence on being upset with people about a tabletop game. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure once uh, once people get their you know their hands into it, and and five years down the road, we'll be having a very different conversation uh, oh, about what's going on the what's going on whether you know whether Wizards new updates to Xanathar's two point oh point one point five mm-hmm. will be ruining Xanathar's. That sounds like a Kingdom Hearts ass title right there. <laughs> <laughs> ass title. <laughs> Tasha's cauldron of three, five, eight days over guide to everything. <laughs> Don't worry, but that's that's a reference like no one in the audience will get but me, which is I'm totally fine with. You know, uh, I, you, I, you create the content you want to watch. Exactly. I don't even. You said five years. I don't even think it's going to be that long. I think we're going to be this time next year. All three of the core rule books are out, and they're going to be talking about. They're going to have a campaign book out, and they're going to be talking about like their next Xanathar style expansion. And mm-hmm. anybody that's playing current Five E, twenty fourteen Five E, and likes it, they're probably going to be moved over by that point already, in my estimation. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say about D and D? No. No. You know what? We're gonna be, like you said. We're gonna be talking about it soon enough. Yep. by By the time you get to the, by the time you're watching the next episode on free feeds, it'll be available for anyone to purchase, which is very very exciting. <laughs> that is pretty next. Exciting. It'll be. Oh, I'm so excited. Next, banned and restricted announcements for Magic it's finally the Gathering. Here. Yes, people were were very upset that they didn't do an emergency banning for Nadu, but. You got what you wanted. Ma- Nadu yep. Summer is officially done, dead, gone forever, from modern specifically. So, 20, August 26th, 2024, we have a new banned and restricted announcement for several formats in Magic the Gathering. Uh, Standard has received no changes. Pioneer has received two bands with Amalia and Sorin Imperious Bloodlord. Amalia is from Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Uh, she is the Orzhov legendary creature that uh, you're putting counters on her, and when you get exactly 20 on her, she blows everything up and is involved in a combo that's kind of been controlling Pioneer ever since Lost Caverns of Ixalan came out. And then Sorin Imperious Bloodlord uh, is, seems to be a very quick uh, banning in Pioneer as uh, the... In, Imperious Bloodlord is the flip lo- the flip uh, walker. Right? No, Imperious Bloodlord came oh, out no, 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 in no, no, twenty. No. Duh, I'm uh, an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, no, but Soren uh, has has not actually seen too much play. I, I was reading the article. Mm. You can read the article on uh, on wizard at magic.wizards.com announcements August twenty sixth ban and restrict yeah. announcements. Uh, but with Soren, the big change was that well, a really big. Uh, uh, Vampire has recently been printed in the Vein Ripper. Yeah. Oh, yes. Vein Ripper combo. That's right. That's right. Being able to cheat it uh, onto the battlefield from your hand with that minus three on the Blood Lord. Such a potent, uh, such potent deck that uh, it's hard to interact with. It really. Well, I mean, Vein Ripper is a souped-up blood artist 
uh, for you gain two, you lose two for sacrifices, and being able for two for three mana cheat that card in by casting Soren and then minus threeing it. And then the Soren gets to stick around too. Yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, you're on turn three at the latest getting a, oh, what is he, a six, seven? He's a six, five with a flying six, and ward sacrifice a creature. Which would then trigger his own ability as yeah, well. Uh, exactly. it, it really took over way too many games. Amal, the Amalia combo has been the bane of anyone that's been playing Pioneer <laughs> for a very long time. Um, so, all good changes there, I think. We're not Pioneer players. Um, no. What I am more familiar with, it, oh, those bans also occur in Explorer, which is the, the, uh, the Magic Arenas. Arena's version of Pioneer. The big one, though, in Modern... Modern received two bans. One of them is uh, the evoke creature Grief. Uh, mm -hmm. Grief was two black black for a 3-2 elemental. It had menace. Uh, it had, when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it, and they discard that card. But and more importantly, it had evoke, where you exile a black card from your hand, and then you would be able to uh, have it enter the battlefield. It gets the trigger, and then immediately it goes to the graveyard. Uh, so effectively, a free look at your opponent's hand and make them discard something. Yeah. Which in one-on-one -on -one formats is deadly. So deadly, in fact, that Grief also got the ban in Legacy as yeah. well. Um, that one has been running around for a very, very long time, and people it's been on the edge of getting banned for a long time as well. Um, uh, which one was the other Evoke one that was banned? It was the red one. Oh, uh, uh, anger. anger or no, no anger is when it goes to the graveyard that gives you haste. That's if you the mounted. Yeah, that's the mountain one. Fury, Ooh, fury, fury was the last one that got banned, and I feel like as time goes on, they're going to realize these evoke elementals are. Each one is just going to become more of a problem <laughs> once the more power, the most powerful one gets banned. Well, it's it's one. Of the, it's definitely one of those things where it's like the uh, the white one is uh, mm -hmm. it's it's a swords to plowshare. On a, on a on a on a feature, yeah. yeah, solitude, and like okay, so your opponent has to have some to interact with, whereas uh, any single target, it's it's one thing, but yeah, with grief, it's turn one, you play your land, you play whatever, and then you immediately get a chop down your opponent's hand, and God forbid before they've they get already, to do anything, before they get do, and God forbid they've mulliganed. Mm -hmm. So. And even if you if you run four copies of Grief, Grief can be pitched to then evoke Grief as well. Yeah. So you don't have like multiple cards in your hand that are making you pitch stuff to cast for free. It, it was it was just a no fun to play against. Yeah. Um, speaking of no fun to play against, <laughs> Nadu Summer is officially done. Nadu Winged Wisdom has caught the ban hammer. Only for modern, though. Uh, it is still legal as your commander in Commander CEH. If you're playing it at a casual commander table as the commander, you're a dickhead. Um, <laughs> Bolt the bird, kids. Bolt the you bird. Can, you can't. Fury the bird, kids. Fury the bird. <laughs> you liter That's the great thing. Bolt the bird. You literally can't, though. It's a 3-4. Uh, but of course, Nadu, the classic uh, one green blue overpowered Simic card. It's a legendary bird wizard with flying, but more importantly, it gives all of your creatures, whenever a creature becomes the target, whenever this creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land, you put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you put it into your hand. This ability triggers only twice each turn. And that is on every single creature. So every mm -hmm. single creature can have this happen twice. And the land does not enter tapped either. Sure. It's a myriad of problems in terms of design, and there's an entire article going over the specifics of uh, the problems with it by Michael Majors, who is the lead designer for uh, Modern Horizons 3. He has an entire article um, about the origin of Nadu and how it came to be and why it's getting banned specifically. But suffice it to say, uh, it created very uh, unfun and long in the tooth play patterns uh mm -hmm. it's it's one of those things that can theoretically go infinite but because it's non-deterministic uh it's if it's, you gotta play it out you have to play it out it's not one of those you can't be like i do this a million times and then i win 
No, yeah. it's like I need to reveal the top card and I need to reveal the top card and I need to see if I'm getting my landfall triggers to create new creatures or if I'm getting a spell that's going to help me whatever, you know. Uh, something, a way to get more creatures, to get more Nadu triggers, to dig further through your deck, and it just, it stalls out games. It's yeah. not fun to play against, and it took over uh, the last uh, Modern Pro Series tournament. What I, what I found very interesting was uh, reading through Major's article. Um, first off, I love, uh, you know, he very straight up says, Nadu Winged Wisdom was a design mistake. Yeah, um, it absolutely is. <laughs> But he he also said things like Ugin's Labyrinth and Canthonian Nightmares are examples of cards that they shipped with eyes wide open, meaning they knew how much power they were injecting into mm-hmm. the into the meta. But with with uh, uh, so in here he tells what um, uh, Nadu's text block looked like originally, which was one green blue legendary creature bird wizard three four flying. You may cast permanent spells as though they had flash, and whenever a permanent you control becomes targeted by a spell or an ability an opponent controls, reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it on the battlefield, otherwise put it into your hand. Uh, and he was pointing out that in initial playtests, these lists that people were coming up with were very, very fragile. Um, and so they did change Nadu, not expecting it to become as as extreme as it is now well by removing the flash aspect of it um it seems like you're powering it down and then all this ability triggers only twice each turn Mm -hmm. also seems like a power down but because every individual creature gains that it is effectively uh as it's effectively as that original design is which is just whenever and, well, it's targeted. whenever when your opponents target it, which is yeah. also, like, yeah. Yeah, the the opponent, yeah, and just making it any target with equip... It, obviously, they weren't going to be thinking of something like Shuko when designing this card, a bulk common right. that just no one would ever think to play. Um, ultimately, it just comes down to the fact that they, they, they one got by the goalie. You know, yeah, that's they, pretty you, much it. You can't you can't play test for everything. You can't expect what players are going to do in a meta, especially at the top level pro series tournaments where there's money on the line. Like people mm-hmm. are gonna eke out every advantage they can with any card that they can find that can give them that advantage. Uh, and Nadu just kind of swung everything in its favor. Uh, from an EDH perspective, uh, Nadu has kind of calmed down a little Mm bit uh we have an entire summer now of cedh tournaments and uh another wonderful youtube channel uh play to win they have the play to win podcast they talk about cedh exclusively we're not cedh players so i don't pretend to understand the meta very well but they went over the top decks of the year so far i would like to note that modern horizons 3 came out in june yeah and it is currently august of this year and Nadu is the third best performing CEDH deck with numbers and success rates that are similar to the uh, slightly below the second best uh, deck in the meta, which is Rog Sai, uh, Rog Rat, and uh, Silas Ren. Uh, and then, of course, the top deck being Blue Farm with uh, Krom Ludovic's Opus and mm-hmm. Timna the Weaver. Uh, just kind of sans green best stuff that you can play. Right. And one thing that they've noticed from their own playing and from what I've seen from gameplay with Nadu and brewing a Nadu list myself just because I pulled so many fucking Nadus. So many Nadus. I pulled like four Nadus. It's ridiculous. Uh, so obviously I kept two of them because they were two different arts. <laughs> and uh, I'm just like slowly assembling a CEDH list for Nadu. And Nadu is going to perform, has been performing very well in CEDH. Um, is going to be a, t- a tier one like top deck, but mm-hmm. it's not going to warp CEDH around it uh, because it forces you to play cards that are not very good. Yeah, the deck doesn't do CEDH. anything otherwise. Yeah, without your commander, it's very hard to make a successful Nadu list. And the ones that have been winning the tournaments have been ones where it's like Nadu is just an engine, 
and you're trying to assemble a combo, trying to s- assemble a win through Finale of Devastation, mm-hmm. through other Simic lines, similar things that you'd find in Kinnon, uh, which has fallen way out of favor, and then just using Nadu as both a lightning rod for removal, to get removal out of your opponent's hands, and then a way to get ramp and card draw very quickly as well. Um, but even to do that, you're forced to play bad cards. Mm-hmm. Like, Shuko's a bad card. <laughs> yeah. And it's only good if Nadu is in play. Uh, and because of that, I don't anticipate Nadu getting the ban hammer in really any other format uh, other than modern yeah. at this point, which I think is totally fine. Uh, if you play it at a casual EDH table, you're an asshole. <laughs> if, the... if people are ready for it, they'll be ready for it, but a lot of people aren't going to be ready for it. No, they are not. Uh, if you want to play it in the 99, say, for example, in, I don't know, maybe like an Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief deck. I guess that's fine. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. It's more fair. <laughs> fair that, I, that Ivy deck is fucking ridiculous, by the way. It's great. Um, I love it. The last banned and restricted portion of this. A, a rare format to be getting bans or restrictions these days Vintage. Yeah. We have Urza's Saga and Vexing Bobble being restricted in the format, meaning you can only run a single copy of them. So Urza's Saga, uh, obviously any format that it is legal in, it is a very low deck building cost to include. Uh, You're able to tutor up your best zero and one mana artifacts from your deck. Um, It's a very powerful land. Mm -hmm. Um, Specifically in Vintage, uh, the main thing, uh, they removed Lurus of the Dream Den, which is a companion card from the banned list. Uh, So they've been going through and slowly removing cards from the banned list in Vintage, just because basically everything is legal, (laughs) anything that's (laughs) ever been printed. But specifically with Urza Saga and Lurus together... Um, Lurus already being restricted and Urza Saga having four copies of it. It's basically taking multiple spots in like every top eight for tabletop and magic online events that run vin- that have vintage options. Mm-hmm. Um, it is widely regarded as like the top strategy in the format. Uh, in, even if you're not grabbing things like Black Lotus with it or like you, you can still get you, you can still get a lot of value out of it with the other things, which also include Vexing Bobble, which you can fetch off of, um, which you can fetch off of Urza Saga. Yep. But with Vexing Bobble specifically, it basically is a one mana that you can fetch off of Urza Saga that stops every free spell. Yeah, any in sort the of game. evoke, any sort of uh, any sort of yeah, force of negation living mm-hmm. end um and as they say in the article in a lot of formats that's good you don't necessarily want everybody to be you know casting mm-hmm. just that's not the goal in vintage no vintage is you jam every low curve card that you possibly can and a single card being able to run four copies of it that you can choose to get rid of when you want to cast your free things yeah um it shuts off all the mocks and it shuts off black lotuses force of will just everything uh, all the powerful things that people are drawn to. It just creates unfun play patterns in that format. Uh, so without getting the full ban, they have both been restricted to mm-hmm. a single copy, which should kind of cool off their impact in the format in general, yep. uh, which I'm kind of surprised that they even restricted anything in Vintage. It feels like other than their recent removal of the attraction and sticker cards, yeah, Vintage hasn't received really a restriction or a ban in a long time that's true yeah i think uh 2001 was kind of the op was kind of when they stopped and started flipping into more of uh the like you mentioned the letting things back into the format 2021 um, not 2001 nope st- it's been uh it's been 23 years since yeah 9 11 <laughs> caused them to start <laughs> letting cars back into vintage cars yeah, that like, hadn't even been designed yet <laughs> Somebody plays, like, I play Lurus of the Dream Den, and everybody's like, what is that? Also, they hit the second tower. 
oh my god why oh my, what is happening and someone busts in the room like oh my god you won't believe it it's like what they're making new cars no they hit the second tower <laughs> <laughs> there's been so many of those they've hit the second tower memes that have been coming out recently and i'm it's so good <laughs> yeah i've been seeing a lot of those too i'm enjoying it mm. all right do you have anything else you want to say about the bnr no no i think we've covered it all and you know it's it's always one good thing to remember that with ban and restricted, obviously they don't deal with commander. Commander rules committee deals with commander bans and restriction. Or well, you can't really restrict anything, in commander. Mm-hmm. But same with popper as well. Same with popper. They have their own or their own committees, uh, and they have and they ban things for very different reasons. You know, very different reasons. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, don't expect a Nadu ban in commander. <laughs> no. No. It's not that powerful. Does it make unfun play patterns? Sure, but it doesn't like break the format. So just Fury the Bird. Just Fury the Bird. Just um what play bad di- like direct damage spells uh that are like four mana that deal four damage to target creatures. There's like a lot of them in like that two to four mana range that deal yeah. four damage. Do lots so of just run those. five for five? Ooh, Lava Axe. That's a classic. That's classic. a classic. Five for five. Yeah, yeah. That's five, a, five, five. Anyway. Not a good card. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to move on to the wrap-up portion of the podcast. Uh, the D&D Direct 2024 is going to be happening tomorrow as of the recording of this. Now, you might be thinking, Connor, why, did you, why are you choosing to record now? Mm-hmm instead of tomorrow after the D&D Direct. Well, if you look at what they're going to be talking about, it's all the same shit that we talked about uh, two podcasts ago? One podcast ago? Two podcasts ago. Who's to say? Time's a weird soup. Uh, Our post-Gen Con podcast, uh, where I was allowed to go to a Wizards of the Coast press event, and they disclosed a lot of information about the Player's Handbook, about the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual, as well as Project Sigil, which is the 3D virtual tabletop. And those are all the things that they're going to be talking about in the D&D Direct. If there is anything interesting that happens in that D&D Direct uh, that they didn't already disclosed to us, which I don't imagine there will be, uh, then we'll definitely bring that up on the next episode of the podcast. But if you are interested in that, uh, if you are watching on free feeds or on the Patreon, actually, this will have already happened. So you can watch the video of it yourself uh, and partake in that. I don't imagine there's going to be anything interesting there. Uh, The last thing to address is Magic the Gathering State of Design 2024. Uh, Every year since 2005, every year, uh, the head designer released a state of design for every year. So Mark Rosewater released on August 19th the 2024 state of design. He goes over all of the sets that had released since the previous state of design which was right before Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. They go over the highlights and lessons learned from all of these sets uh, and also have some interesting tidbits of information. Um, Sam, if you have anything in particular you want to call out, the only thing that I find that I found particularly interesting uh, are the fact that he, (laughs) he discloses for the first time that Wizards of the Coast is legal and wants to reprint powerful staples like mm-hmm. the One Ring and Orcish Bowmasters. They are allowed to do so in a universe's beyond format, even. So straight up the One Ring and straight up Orcish Bowmasters, they are allowed to reprint. And, of course, they can create their own in-universe equivalents of them as well, Um, which I find very interesting and not something I would have expected with their contract negotiation for this universe's beyond. Yeah, that's been a big big question uh, since they started printing universes beyond and actually why we have very few universes within things, things like the Stranger Things, the Street Fighter, um, there was a big, big issue with can they reprint them? Are they allowed to? Uh, and and oftentimes, you know, questions of like, why would they print this certain card here where they might not be able to get access to it in the future? Uh, so that's very, it is very, um, 
it's very telling how big how big of a uh, impact these cards you know the the card designs themselves yeah were not expected to just be kind of throwaways or anything like that yeah it's it, it, it's honestly a, a bit of forethought that I haven't really been expecting from Wizards of the Coast in recent releases that they've had. So mm-hmm. it's good to know that they have that on their mind, at the very least, uh, to keep in mind for various releases. Um, I <sighs> When's the next most expensive set <laughs> coming out? <laughs> Because whenever, whenever they're doing their next master set or their next um, uh, um, Horizons or whatever their next yeah. like premium set is, that's where you're going to get your reprint of Orcish Bowmasters. That's where you're going to get your reprint of The One Ring. Mm-hmm. And eventually you might get like an in-universe version added to like a bonus sheet. Like just anything they can to help push those packs. Right. Uh, you're not going to see just like a, oh, you can get Orcish Bowmasters in Duskborn. House of Four. Duskborn. <laughs> oh, we're going to reprint the One Ring in Foundations. It's like you're not going to. That's not going to happen at all. <laughs> it's a very long. <laughs> what is that? That is the washing machine. <laughs> it has a jingle? It has a jingle. <laughs> that's so long. It's still going. <laughs> that is so stupidly long. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. That's like those Japanese toilets that like sing to you. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, but, but yeah, you could go check out the state of design. It goes from Lord of the Rings, Tales of Middle Earth, and then every set all the way through Modern Horizons 3. Uh, it shows what they've learned, some of the highlights, uh, what people liked about those sets. And it pretty much coincides with what we've been saying. Uh, people really liked the bonus sheets for Wilds of Eldraine and Lost Converts of Ixalan. Uh, they recognized that Murders at Karlov Manor was not a very good set in terms of mechanics uh, and theme. They they acknowledged that Thunder Junction was kind of thin um, mm-hmm. and that Modern Horizons 3 was busted beyond belief. <laughs> but kind yeah, of they... on purpose. Yeah, I think... Uh... You know, obviously, like like you said, with uh, specifically um, the the story stuff, um, he mentioned in here that you know we were seeing post Frexian invasion, and a lot of people have complained about the fact that there has not been a more major impact, or like we're not seeing that on the um, on the planes we're going to, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's, yeah, it's not just. There, there's a lot of stuff they talk about with the different uh, mechanics across sets, how some were too complex. Um, and he said that uh, this year the mechanics were more polarizing than in previous years. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, you know, going forward, hopefully, like, like we were talking about earlier, there's going to be this, this new box, you know, this new uh, NASCAR set. Um, effectively, this new interplanetary or interplanar race coming up. Sure. And and my worry is it's going to be too much like the murder at Karloff Manor, where it's got weird mechanics. Obviously, mm-hmm. they're going to be bringing back vehicles. That's like a given. But Obviously. It's like, if they focus too much on this weird storyline, and, and same with Thunder Junction, where they're just bringing in legendary creatures from across the plains and don't really explain why. Mm-hmm. Which was another big issue with Thunder Junction was why are why is you know why is Mar- Marchesa worked so long to become the queen of her pl- of there of you know that why is she here? Yeah, there's no reason for her to be there. There's no yeah. reason for Obeka to be there. There's no reason for a lot of those characters to be there. They just wanted to get cool new legends with names that you recognize. Um, it even it, you mentioned like the the mechanics themselves. Like some of mm-hmm. them are just like they mentioned being not fun to play at the table. Like yeah. uh, with Wilds of Eldraine, the roll tokens and the roll enchantments, it's like, oh, creating a token enchantment that you can only have one of, of that kind of enchantment on is an interesting design space. But if you're playing limited and you don't have that token, mm-hmm. uh, you, it, it's annoying to play with at the table. And then they all kind of are the same. 
Like yeah. They're not really m- very mechanically unique from one another. Yeah. Uh, or and, and, and like every set from <laughs> from Murders at Karlov Manor, it's like disguise is just morph with extra steps. And then collecting evidence is a thing. And it's just clunky mechanics to play with in the first place. Yeah, and when they tried to, with uh, Mirza Karlov Manor, they tried to lean on the detective typo, um, especially in blue, white, and blue, black, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of fell on its face because that was the only set with detectives. Yeah, there's no broader support for it. On the other hand, just generic typo stuff. Yeah. On the other hand, for Lord of the Rings, you had the halflings. Like there, there have been other halflings in D, uh, from like D and D sets, and that one turned out to be a, ve- a very, uh, a very big uh, hit with people. Mm-hmm. And even like orcs and goblins, uh, like there mm-hmm. aren't a lot of orcs, but they made sure to lump them in with goblins, so it had that base of stuff. Elves, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, it, that base. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a lot to learn. I think last year the sets were much better. Um, Wilds of Eldraine, Lost Caverns of Ixalan specifically really stand out as like the they were very, very good yeah. sets. Absolutely. For, and when you look at what we've had in 2024, it's like we started the year with probably the worst set that we've had in a long time <laughs> with Murders of Karlov Manor and Thunder Junction, while mechanically better, mm-hmm. uh, better to play with, it has better cards in it. Um, just, it, it was hollow. It was, uh, yeah. Horizon, the Modern Horizons 3 is always going to be a massive hit. Uh, Bloomborough is like the standout set of the year. Yeah. And I, w- I would rival that with what I think is the best set of last year. Best regular set. Obviously, I think the best set of last year is Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yeah. But the best like regular set being Lost Caverns of Ixalan, in my mind. Mm-hmm. I, th- I would put Bloomborough up against that. And I, th- I would argue that I think Bloomborough might be even a bit better than Lost Caverns of Ixalan. It's more unique. It feels fresh and new. and they, It I, really feels like they took, you know, the fact they, they, it feels like so for so long, because even in Ixalan, they had the uh, uh, Jurassic Park prints. Mm-hmm. And it feels like for the, you know, first time in a long time, they just took the fact that they have their own unique universes and mm-hmm. uh, their own unique style of, 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 of lore and actually made it to Bloomborough. And it's like a, a mostly all new characters and even the returning characters like Ral, you're getting them presented in a new way because they all have to be animals. Um, yeah. Interesting new mechanics with offspring, uh, returning of card types that people really liked with the class enchantments. And it, I, it's a really, really good set. And I, 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 I would not be surprised if it's the best one of the year at all. Um, okay. Well, that's our little wrap up. We will end this podcast as we always do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience, which I did not requisition because I'm moving. <laughs> <laughs> and we're again, we're not on TikTok this week and possibly no. for the foreseeable future. Uh, so we don't have any qu- questions or comments from there. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of an abrupt way to just end podcast oh we got to thank brandon vol of course our 15 dollars a month uh subscriber over at patreon.com slash the dungeon bros you can join for five dollars a month for early ad free access to the podcast you get it the wednesday before the monday it releases for live feeds with no ad uh or you can just join for free if you want to do questions comments concerns thoughts and or ideas when i actually post the thread onto the patreon uh which i did not do in this instance that happens but yeah you know um it's exciting new time. I think once I have a desk and I don't have to like hold it here and like put my elbows on my knees the entire podcast, I think this is going to be a much more enjoyable experience. Uh, <laughs> in general, I will have I'll, I won't look so red and backlit and awful in the next episode. Hopefully, we we'll record see. in two. We record in two weeks. If I don't have it, if I don't have my desk set up in two weeks, then something has gone horrifyingly wrong. Um. Or I've been distracted by the fact that I need to like lay flooring or something, which I did yeah, over I the mean, weekend. I'm exhausted. I hate it. <laughs> I mean, you gotta have floors to put the desk on. There's subfloor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
It's it's effectively I, the same, right? I I lived in a house uh, that only had subflooring during during college, and man, that was scary. It should have been well, condemned. Honestly, it probably th- was. The thing is, this house is so old. It's from like the nineteen hundred, basically. <laughs> like it's like nineteen twenty, nineteen thirty, I think, and like the the subfloor was just floor. Yeah, that's true. That's but fair. it's a hundred year old floor. <laughs> so it's like got chunks missing and it's not finished. Like it's yeah. a raw wood and like all this stuff. And it's like, okay, well we're just going to put some, we're going to put some nice modern vinyl over top mm. of that in Ooh. the form of planks that like Ooh. click together very nicely. But here's a real question. Yeah. Is it haunted? Not that I'm aware of quite yet. I haven't spent the night here yet. I've got big furniture coming in. We're recording this on a Monday in two days from now. When it goes live on the Patreon for patrons over at patreon.com slash Dungeon Bros, that's when I'm moving the big furniture. <laughs> um, so dressers, bed, uh, sectional, that kind of stuff, uh, washer, dryer. And at that point, I'll be spending the night here. So we'll and see. Then you'll know. I, I work right, at, so we- I, I get up at, for work at three in the morning. So if I'm getting woken up early by by the denizens of the house, then we'll find out. Yeah. Right around right around the time Duskmorn previews will start. So, you know. Maybe I'll get lucky. Maybe you guys will get lucky in the next episode of the podcast I'm just possessed by like some <laughs> some deceased like twelve year old from nineteen forty three or something. If you that know. World War II age child can can figure out how to set up the uh, the Riverside, I will be surprised. Fucking, fucking props to them if they can. <laughs> right, right. Like, well, well, interview with a ghost will be an interesting <laughs> podcast for the Dungeon Bros. <laughs> and you know they had one example of it here today. So if if you could figure it out, <laughs> fucking have at it, bitch. All right, cool. I'm going to, we're going to post this and someone's going to, I feel like Wyatt would be the person that would take like a still from this and just like Photoshop a ghost behind me or something like it like bloomed out in the window or something and, and like send it to us, which would be hilarious. We just start, we get on another podcast, but not us, just somebody else talking about our podcast and how it's like, <laughs> oh, this one guy has a ghost behind him. You can see it. Have you, have you ever heard of the dungeon bros? Well, they're these two guys who one of them is haunted and it's like, we go viral for that dumb reason. I start I start doing the podcasts, and every single time I just I'm like <gasps> the entire time because I'm like I'm like possessed or or it's like the 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 clips of people that are like trying to freak out their partners in bed be, by like putting themselves like up on a stool under the covers to make them yeah. look like they're like levitating off the bed and freak people out. Just that <laughs> in podcast form. Well, All right, this has been an adventure. This is this has been something. This is the first episode of what will not be on the platforms as season two because that's just a pain in the ass, and I don't want to start tracking that ever. So this is everything's ever always going to be season one. But this is effectively the new season of the Dungeon Bros Pod or not the Dungeon Bros Podcast. Jesus, the Duel of the Mandorks Podcast. It hasn't been the Dungeon Bros Podcast in a very long time. The Duels in Manadorks podcast, episode 74, is now concluded. Banned, restricted, uh, change logged, controversy. It's all fine. <laughs> Everything's fine here. <laughs> Nothing yeah. is wrong. <laughs> That's the state of design. That is the state of the design. My gonna, did we miss anything? Uh, okay, we hit all the bits. Uh, 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 D&D director, okay. Oh, I need to hold on. The ill is empty. It's time to go. Uh, it's been very fun. We'll see you again in two weeks when we have to talk about the D&D Direct because I said nothing important was going to happen on it and now certainly something is going to, important is going to happen on it because that's just how this is. But again, yeah. we'll see you on the next episode. We love you very much. And as always, 